Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? The man answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to vindicate himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and took off, leaving him dead. Now by the, half dead, excuse me, that changes the story. <laughs> half dead. <laughs> Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came upon him, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, treating them with oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. In Sunday school, we were simply taught the core value of this story. If you see someone in need, be like the Good Samaritan and help them. This value is so universal that it has crept out of our faith tradition and into common vernacular. Even people who have never set foot in a church understand what it means to be a Good Samaritan. And we have schools and hospitals, nursing homes, and even credit unions named after this fictional character that Jesus creates in this parable. But the parable itself is much more layered and complex than our beloved Sunday school teachers were able to explain to us as children. First of all, the religious expert who is engaging Jesus with the questions that prompt the telling of this parable is noted in scripture as testing Jesus and wanting to justify or vindicate himself. So this conversation is charged from the beginning. The religious expert is asking questions to press Jesus, perhaps to try and trip him up in his answers, perhaps to see if this guy knows what he's really talking about, perhaps a little bit of both. But Jesus' story isn't just a sweet tale reminding us to be kind to others. Samaritans were people living in the same region as Jesus and the Hebrew people. Samaritanism and Judaism share a common origin in Israel, but the rift between the two communities had already been growing for centuries before Jesus' birth. They had been there since the conquest by Assyria in 722 BCE, and they opposed rebuilding the temple and the concept of Jerusalem as a holy city. So the faith has its own priesthood, its own religious calendar, its own theology, and therefore in Jesus' time, Samaritans were considered ceremonial unclean, socially outcast, and complete religious heretics. So hearing this parable, which paints a Samaritan as the hero, would have felt deeply uncomfortable to its original audience. Jesus is essentially saying that anyone who practices mercy and compassion, regardless of their religious affiliation, is living out God's law, which leads to eternal life. This is radical. What's more is we know nothing about the man who's been attacked by robbers. We don't know his social class. We don't know his ethnicity. We don't know his religion. He could have been a disciple of Jesus. He could have been a Samaritan like the man who stops to help him. He could have been a Jewish citizen like the men who pass him by. We know nothing about the moral character of the victimized man. Was he robbed because he was wealthy and flaunting it? 
or because he was associating with men of ill repute. Being robbed of all his clothing indicates that his clothes were valuable, so perhaps he was wearing some flashy designer tunic and sandals. Maybe he was carrying a fancy bag of treasures. Jesus leaves all those details out to emphasize that it does not matter who the man was. The Samaritan didn't consider anything about this man other than his desperate situation and decided to help. The priest and the Levite, on the other hand, considered the situation from a distance. They immediately crossed the street to avoid helping the half-dead man. What they assess from their vantage point is that helping the man in his battered, bloody state would be a great inconvenience to them. As so-called holy religious leaders, their purity laws would have dictated that they could not touch a bloody or dead body without then ritually purifying themselves because they would have been considered defiled. So they avoided helping this man because of their religion. And Jesus says, no, 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 this is backwards. The commandment to love your neighbor as yourself means that you treat your neighbor like one of your own, like family, like a member of your own faith community. Your religion should compel you to be compassionate and selfless, even if it means you're going to have to go out of your way, you're going to have to spend some extra time, you're going to have to spend some extra money, and you're very likely going to get nothing in return for your actions. And if the laws of your religion have become such that they prevent you from being kind to another human being, then that religion is defunct. If your religion is only skin deep and it doesn't penetrate your heart to compel you to get your hands dirty, maybe even bloody, to spend some of your own money, to share the resources that you have to improve someone else's life, to be kind when no one else is watching, then you have to question the nature of your religion, or at the very least, your engagement with it. You know, the title, The Good Samaritan, didn't appear in any ancient manuscripts. That was added at some point in the first millennium in a translation of the Bible after scholars had begun dividing the books into chapters and numbered verses. This was all part of the development of the printing press. And that just made it easier for all of us to reference where in the Bible we can find these stories. And whoever decided on this title for this section of the story, this particular parable, chose the word good to describe the Samaritan. And I find that so interesting. Why did he call him the good Samaritan? Was he, why couldn't he just label him like the neighborly Samaritan or the faithful Samaritan or the compassionate and kind Samaritan? He chose the good Samaritan. So I wonder if the publisher just felt like the word good just encompasses all of those qualities. He's kind, he's compassionate, he's faithful, he's neighborly. He's just a really good guy. He sees an injured man left for the dead on the side of the road, and it takes a certain type of awareness, a certain type of selflessness to pull one's nose out of one's navel long enough to notice someone else's pain. The compassion he has on this injured man. It takes a certain kind of open heart, a loving heart, to feel compassion for someone else's struggle. So first he has this awareness, someone is struggling, and then he has this openness of heart to feel something because of seeing that struggle. Then he approaches the victim. That approach is a big deal. The other two men see it, they maybe felt something, but they definitely crossed the, the street to go away from this pain. This man approaches the victim, and he bandages up his wounds. He pours oil and wine on them. He puts him on his own animal, and he takes him to an inn, and he cares for him that whole first night. I think sometimes we forget that part of the story. He doesn't just help him on the side of the road and send him on his way. He takes him to an inn and cares for him for one whole night. It takes deep kindness to arrange 
rearrange your entire day, all of your plans, your whole night, to assist someone else in need. But then he keeps going. The next day, he wakes up in the morning and he gives the innkeeper two denarii because ostensibly this man is still not well enough to travel on his own. He gives him two denarii. That's the equivalent of two days pay. And he asks the innkeeper to continue caring for this beaten man. And he promises to pay the innkeeper back whatever beyond this two days pay he decides he needs to spend to make sure this man is well. It takes extreme generosity to ensure ongoing care for a total stranger, knowing that you will receive nothing in the form of repayment. It becomes too cumbersome to try and capture all of these qualities, these adjectives in a description of the Samaritans above and beyond behavior in this story. And perhaps that is why the printers and the scholars agreed to simply label him as good. He does many good things in Jesus' telling of this story. But I keep thinking back to that initial beginning of his goodness when he approaches the dying man without fear, without disgust, without anxiety. He decides that the call to help a fellow human being is worth coming nearer worth the cost, whatever it may end up being, and for the record, it ends up being a lot. If Jesus is teaching all of us something in this pointed parable, I believe he's teaching us to overcome our fears and anxieties regarding those who are different from us in order to tap into the deeper layers of our humanity to access the divine love that is imprinted on each of our hearts in order to live out kindness and generosity and compassion and courage. In all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is quoted as saying, the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed. No one will say, look, here it is, or oh, there it is, for in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. It's here. It's not far away. It's not up in the clouds. It's not just a vision for the future. Jesus says in all four Gospels, it is here. It is at hand, meaning it is as close as your hand. It is within your physical grasp. It is within your reach. The kingdom of God is among us. And if we believe that teaching, then we must always be looking for moments to draw closer to it, to move closer to the pain and the suffering of others, not to turn away in discomfort or cross the street to preserve ourselves from the inconvenience of helping others. And don't get me wrong, sometimes our decisions to detach or disengage or walk away from someone else are healthy and justified for safety reasons, for sanity reasons, for self-care reasons. But other times, our decision to keep our distance is determined by our attempts to play it safe, to avoid the kind of intimacy that might result in our heart being cracked wide open. Sometimes we keep our distance in order to avoid facing hard truths about who we really are and how deep our faith does or doesn't affect the way we live our lives. That's the kind of decision-making that we as people of faith have to lean into. If the Levite and the priest had come closer to the brutalized man, they would have had no doubt an opportunity to face some hard truths about themselves and their beliefs and I suspect they were not ready to do that. Hard truths that they had probably spent their whole lives pretending, maybe even hoping, did not exist. If you truly want to love your neighbor as yourself, says Jesus, you must commit to drawing near. Your neighbor is not just the person living next door to you. Your neighbor is not just someone who happens to be very convenient for you to help. 
Your neighbor is not the one who checks all the boxes of who you would like to spend some time with. Your neighbor is whoever is experiencing pain. Your neighbor is whoever is struggling. Your neighbor is whoever is going through some hard stuff and not handling it well. Your neighbor is someone who is overwhelmed with grief or depression or anxiety or low self-esteem or heartbreak. Your neighbor is someone who is suffering and yet to whom you must choose to draw nearer. Your neighbor is someone who needs help and yet to whom you still choose to get closer to. Your neighbor is someone who may even resist your help and to whom you still choose to draw near. This concept of drawing near to suffering should be very familiar to those of us who follow Jesus. For God's decision to become human is exactly this, a commitment to closeness, a determination to close the distance between us. In the person of Jesus, God is making a choice for nearness. The Good Samaritan comes near to suffering because he's choosing to love his neighbor as himself. He's choosing to treat another human the same way he wishes he would be treated. The priest and the Levite would have had all the right answers if someone quizzed them on their theology or on the scriptures. They would have had all the right friends. They would have been well respected in society. They were no doubt wearing clothing that earned admiration from others. But their actions did not line up with the commandment they were supposed to hold sacred. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Instead, it is the Samaritan, the other with a capital O, it is he who lives out God's holy law, not because his faith instructs him to do it, but because his heart compels him to do it. As Jesus said, may we go and do likewise. Amen.